Good morning, Grove family and friends. We're so thankful to get to gather with you this morning and we're expectant for what the Lord has for us. And we want you to know we've been praying for you this week and we're just thankful for this space to come together and join in in God's word. It's gonna be a good day. I just have a few announcements for you today. And the first one is I get to share with you a little bit about the Pregnancy Help Center of Williamson County. We've been partner, partnering with them for the last four years. So some of you may be really familiar, but for those of you who are not, they come alongside families with unexpected pregnancies and they offer them all kinds of support and resources. And it starts with a listening ear and hearing their journeys. And then they also offer classes in, um, on parenting and meet tangible needs like diapers and formula and baby clothes. And so at this time of year, they have a baby bottle campaign. And usually we pass out bottles and you fill it with your donations and then we hand it back. But this year we're going virtual, which is awesome that we have that um, opportunity and space to do that. So we're asking that you consider prayerfully how the Lord might have you give to them as they love these families to the Lord and support them on their journey. So go check out their website. We've provided the link below and learn more about what they do. We're so grateful for them and we're so grateful for your continued generous giving. Next, we get to talk about adding next week our face-to-face -face gathering. So next week we move to a meeting back at the junior high and we meet at 9 and 10 30 our regular gathering times um, but we also um, are going to be practicing social distancing so we won't have our children's ministry our students ministry yet that's coming but we want you to bring your families and your kids and have them sit with you as we practice social distancing we're so excited that we finally get to do this but with that we're going to be continuing to stream online but instead of at 9 a.m seeing us online we will be streaming at 1030. So we will have both a face-to-face -face gathering and online streaming from here on out. And we are so grateful and so excited. So we hope you can join us um, either way. We, either way, we can't wait to see you. Um, lastly, this is the first Sunday of the month, which means we're taking communion together. And so you can go grab juice, water, crackers, bread, whatever you need to take communion as a family as Scott leads us through it a little bit later in the message. Okay, that's all I have for you today. So grab your coffee, get comfortable, and let's get ready to worship. Good morning, Grove Online. It's great to greet you here once again. And if this is your first time with us, we're especially glad that you've tuned in here this morning. And if you're part of the Grove family, I uh, miss you guys. We miss you. Can't wait to see you hopefully here pretty, pretty soon. Well, this morning, things are going to look a little bit different than we normally do. But in light of the climate of our country, in light of racism that is alive and prevalent, in light of the anger and the hurt and the fear and the violence that's all over all over the place. As a church, we just wanna stop and be in this moment. And being in this moment can feel uncomfortable. And if you feel uncomfortable this morning, it's okay. But I think as we're in this moment of time, it's important for us as the body of Christ, just to pause, to mourn, to reflect, and to look for wisdom from God's word, not from any social media outlet, not from anybody else's opinion. The only opinion that really truly matters during this time is what the Bible teaches us. So this morning, I just want to encourage you just to have an open heart, an open mind. Scott is going to lead us through a conversation, and we're going to look at what the Bible teaches. Um, and hopefully at the end of this time, all of us will have a better understanding of what the heart of God is. The heart of God is for all people of every nation, of every color, of every social economic background. 
So like we normally do, we're going to start our time by putting our hearts and our minds and just focus on, on Jesus. So before we dive in, I wanna, I'm going to just pray for us. And um, I guess one last thing, that if you're watching right now, if you're watching live, you know, I want to encourage you. Maybe this is the first time that you should hear that, hit that share button on Facebook. Or if you're watching later, if there's someone out there that you feel needs to be a part of this moment with us as a church, I would encourage you to share this link with them. But with that, I'm going to just turn our attention and our minds to Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father, our Lord and Savior, during this time, we come before you. We bow down before you. We lay down our, our thoughts, our anxiety, our fears, our worries, our anger. We lift up the evil that's all over, all over our country right now. And during this time, I just pray that Jesus, that your name would be exalted. That as people have questions and have doubts, and aren't unsure of where to go. Lord, I pray that this would be a time that your church and your bride would stand up and remind people that there is hope, and that hope is found in the name of Jesus, the name that makes the darkness tremble, the name that silences fear. So Holy Spirit, meet us here this morning. Help us to get past ourselves. Help us to get past the awkwardness of sitting at home watching this over a screen, but I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move us closer to you this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus Silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Free, call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again. I will pray.
God I serve knows only how to triumph And my God will never fail Oh my God will never fail And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to and I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord oh, 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 oh. There's power, there's power Just he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. I know, yes, I know how this story ends. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You take, 
You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good All things you take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take one more time Take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good You turn it all around You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good And I'm gonna see a victory And I'm gonna see a victory see a victory in Jesus' name. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good You turn it for good Father, this morning, we turn our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And God, as we dive into this topic this morning, God, I pray that you truly would break our hearts for the things that breaks yours. God, change our perspective if it needs to be changed. Align us to what your Holy Spirit wants us to, wants us to act and react during this time. So have your way in this place. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, hey, good morning, Grove family. Uh, and thanks for tuning in this morning. If you're a guest, man, I'm glad that you're, you're checking out the Grove. Uh, I'm excited that this is, uh, I think, hopefully, this is my last week of staring at a camera and that next week I get to be in front of some of your faces and uh, be able to have kind of a conversation versus what's happening, uh, what's happening in the last few weeks. And so I'm glad to see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, I know for a lot of us, like when we come to, to hear God's word, we come for the purpose of comfort. And I know there are many in our church that are going through really difficult times. Uh, The loss of loved ones, uh, sickness and disease, financial uh, issues. And so we we look to God uh, to get the comfort and stability that only he can give. And that's the rightful place for us to go because um, God is the God of comfort. But he's also um, a God that convicts us uh, in our sin. Uh, Because he designed life the way that life should be lived, meaning if we're going to get the best out of life, we live we live it the way that he's called us to live it. In fact, Jesus said that if we want to, that he came to give life and give it to its full. And so there's no greater satisfaction, you know, there's no greater joy, uh, there's there's no greater peace uh, than being in relationship with God and living a life that he's called us to, a life that that honors him. Now, these last few weeks, um, a lot has been happening in our world. 
Um, and it's evident that racism is alive and well, and the racial divide, I mean, it just, it just seems to be getting wider and wider. And as we seek to honor God, I mean, as believers, as we want to live lives that honor and worship him, uh, what doesn't honor him is the sin of racism, um, as well as standing idle, as well as uh, for us to remain neutral, for our mouths to be shut, to be sitting on our hands, uh, and to not do anything to the injustice that is raging uh, in our world and in our country right now. Um, I saw a quote from Will Smith uh, from an interview he did with Stephen Colbert a few years ago, uh, where he said, racism is not getting worse, it's getting filmed. And our world is getting smaller, and that's definitely true. It's just more and more things are, are getting filmed. I was, I was talking with um, a black friend of mine this week, and I told him that I was, I was thankful. I was thankful that uh, there was video um, of the murder of George Floyd so that it couldn't be denied, it couldn't be brushed under the rug, that there would be justice you know, for him. And I was, of course, angered and saddened and frustrated over the complete disregard for his life. Uh, and his response to me was, well, why this one? Like, why George Floyd? Why all of a sudden now are you frustrated and angered? And why not, why not the many others that also have been on film, whether that's Trayvon Martin or Tamir Rice or Michael Brown, uh, Eric Garner or Breonna Taylor? And, you know, you could just keep going because the list is, um, is sad. It, it, the list is long and um, it's grievously long. And of course, then there's all the unnamed acts of of racism that happen every day in, in our world that black Americans have just grown accustomed to. So, so, so why now? Um, why the outrage? And that's something that I've been, been thinking about um, over this last week. And uh, of course, I, I've been angry and I've been frustrated at times past, um, but this is just kind of a boiling point for me. And you know, I started to kind of look around and I looked around at our own church and I thought, man, there's, there's no outrage. I don't see any outrage. I don't see, like, no one's asking me, like, what is, what is our church response gonna be? I mean, there's only one person that did, and that was, that was Oscar. And so I did what we normally do, like, when we're frustrated about something is that we just finger point. It's just so much easier to point our finger at other people and be like, why aren't you outraged? Why aren't you upset? I'm frustrated. I'm outraged, and why are you not? And that was until, I mean, the Holy Spirit really just convicted me and revealed like my own failings. Listen, I, I have failed um, as your pastor uh, to speak boldly against racism consistently. I mean, sure, I've, I've spoken up about injustices as they've come. I mean, they come all the time. I mean, every single weekend, you know, I could be talking about it. And so many times um, I ignored them, didn't acknowledge them. And what has been revealed to me is that I clearly have, have not enough, have not done enough. I mean, how, how could I, something I've been thinking about, how can I preach the gospel faithfully um, and omit or, and ignore the injustice of racism? Now, the gospel is grounded in justice. I mean, that's what the gospel is all about. Now, racial reconciliation is not the gospel, um, but out of the gospel, the fruit of the gospel uh, flows racial reconciliation. And so I, mean, I, I wanna repent to you for the good uh, that I have not done, that I have not spoken boldly about the gospel that produces racial reconciliation in our own church. You know, for me to be consistent about that. I know that I have, I have a lot to learn and I want God to, to shape my heart so that I love people that are not like me the way that God loves them. And I hope and pray um, that our church, the Grove, would love people that are not like us the way that God loves them, the way that God has called us to, and that we would lock arms with our black brothers and sisters and join this fight of injustice that has been raging for years, for hundreds of years. Now, the Capital C Church um, has a history of neglecting and mismanaging cultural issues. And I think this one is like, it's number one. I mean, even among believers, there's this crazy divide. And yet we have black brothers and sisters that are hurting. I mean, it's funny. I think Satan is at work and just distracting us with looting and politics and all these other things. And what is not being heard I mean, is the voices of grief, the voices of pain, and us taking the time to listen to their pain. Now, we live in a predominantly white community, you know, and our church represents the community that we live in. 
And so just the lack of proximity for some, you know, not having maybe black friends, uh, not uh, having access to a black community, that lack of proximity can breed a lack of empathy. You know, it's in a community like ours where racism can find its home without any risk of eviction. It's in a community like ours that is, you know, majority white, uh, what's homogenous, that it's easy for us to allow racism to go below the surface. And it, it might peep its head every once in a while, but ultimately there's, there's no threat, there's no tension, uh, there's no confrontation of it. I think a lot of, a lot of people, they don't feel outrage. You know, they don't feel grief. You know, there isn't anger because it seems like it's out there. You know, those are for, for those people out there and not, not for us here. You know, it's, it's for some, they don't even believe that it even exists. I mean, there's a lot of contention and opinion. And what I've observed is that few are listening. Instead, we're so quick to justify evils. We're so quick to abdicate our responsibility as believers that that, that is an injustice that no one agrees with, but that someone else is gonna take care of it you know, that someone else is going to respond to it, that that someone else's fight, that someone else's war, and it's, and it's not mine. And yet, and yet this is at the core of the gospel. Either we are working and sacrificing and seeking to do justice to shrink this racial divide, or we're making it worse. There, there's only two options. There's only two options for us. Either we are helping to shrink it or we're guilty of widening it. See, the gospel leaves no no room for neutrality. You know, the gospel will not allow us to stay idle. The gospel will not allow us to stay content with this injustice. Listen, Jesus, he didn't shy away from difficult topics. You know, he didn't shy away from difficult conversations, nor did he respond with hate. Instead, he spoke to his culture uh, with clarity and compassion. And the Bible is filled. It's overflowing with how God's people are to respond to injustices in our world, of how we're to respond to those that are vulnerable, those that are marginalized, and those that are being oppressed. I mean, next week, we're going to see one instance after the other of how Jesus addressed the racial divide in his own day and how it angered those in his culture, but he didn't shy away from it. Instead, he hit it straight on. You know, God says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. This, this isn't a suggestion, but this is a command. It's a command that for those that obey, show themselves to truly be God's people. And so this morning, uh, we're going to see just how the Bible or what the Bible has to say to this injustice. And yes, there are a lot more injustices in our world and there's other racial divides, but what's right in front of us right now is between black and white and this injustice of racism that we cannot ignore. So let me just say just a few things. The first is, is that for some of you, I'm not going to say enough. And we have more weeks to go that we're going to talk about this. And it's hard to kind of pare all this down into one message. That's been my biggest struggle because there's so many things that need to be said. But some may think, some may think that I'm not going to say enough. Others of you may think that I'm going to say too much, that I'm going to step on your toes, that I'm going to say things that anger us. And let me just tell you that that's what happens when there's sin within our life. You know, when, when God's word steps on our pride or gets in the midst of our sin, we get angry, we get defensive, you know, and there's the temptation to take my words out of context. I say something that angers you, you check out, and then you come back in and you hear something, but you've missed the middle the critical middle. So I just encourage you to tune in. Some of you may think that this is going to get political, but let me just uh, bring the truth of it is that racism is woven into the economic, social, and political realms of our culture. It is absolutely political. And so it's important for us as believers, Christ followers, as the church, the grow, for us to, to rise above and to hear God's word by remembering that we are first citizens of the kingdom of God. That's who God has called us to be. He's called us to serve um, others and not to be served. He's called us to champion uh, the, the preservation of others over ourselves. He's called us to champion the protection of others over ourselves. He's called us to love and to sacrifice and to lay down our lives. That wasn't a suggestion, but it was a command to lay down our lives the way that he did. He's called us to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. And listen, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit 
that we're enabled to have a heart transformed for us to, to live the life that God has called us to, for us to fight this injustice and to do what God has called us to do. And so um, as we dive into scripture before we do, would you join me in, in prayer? Heavenly Father, only you are wise. It's only you that has the solution to the brokenness and pain and grief that our, our black brothers and sisters are experiencing and have experienced for hundreds of years. I pray that you would grieve our hearts this morning. I pray that you would put outrage where there's apathy. I pray that your spirit would give us eyes to see what you see. I pray that you would strike down our pride. I pray that you would give us a new heart and a new spirit and remove our hearts of stone. That God, you'd put your Holy Spirit in us and cause us to walk in your ways and to obey your word. Strengthen our church so that we are faithful in loving others. We are faithful in seeking justice, that we would not shortchange the gospel, but see its full transforming power in our lives and in this world. I pray that the gospel would bring healing and continue to narrow this racial divide until the day you return where every nation, tribe, language worships you in unity and community. This morning, I pray that as your word goes out, that it would do its necessary work in us so that our lives would honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I was, um, I was in elementary school uh, when I first watched the sermon from uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, where he famously preached, I have a dream. And we have a, just a, a short excerpt of that. And so I want you to check this out. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So, so listen to what Dr. King said. He said, no, no, we are not satisfied. We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I mean, this is the, the first time that I heard these words. And it wasn't until years later, and never in a sermon, mind you, which is a bit troubling, that I came to know that Dr. King was quoting Amos 5, verse 24, where it says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When I, when I heard that, I was too young to really understand what that meant. I mean, I didn't understand the unfulfilled longing. I, I didn't understand the deep hunger and thirst to be satisfied. I didn't understand the, the beauty and the power of, of justice and righteousness. And I didn't understand how justice and righteousness was being denied to black Americans. Now, fast forward to today, and I, I see it and I hear it, and it's still ever present in our world. Well, Amos, he was a prophet from Tekoa, a shepherd that, that God used to speak on his behalf to the people during the reign of King Jeroboam II, the king of Israel and of Uzziah of Judah in the first half of the eighth century BC. So Amos, he called out God's people because they were not living lives that honored God. And as we move through this scripture, you're gonna see why Dr. King used this passage uh, in his sermon. So let's listen to what God has to say to us in Amos 5, starting in verse 18. 
He says, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? So Amos, he addresses and acknowledges that the people of God, like they're longing for the day. And he's referring to the day of, of judgment, the day of salvation, the day of, of God's return. And so he acknowledges that, that they're looking forward to this future day, this future salvation. And they were right in doing that. I mean, as believers, we long for the day of Christ's return, uh, but they were wrong in thinking that they were okay. They were wrong in assuming that they were good with God. Because as we'll see, is that, is that they weren't. It, it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, where he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, listen to this, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I mean, what, what a frightening and sobering verse. This caution from Jesus that there are many that think that they're good with God and, and they're not. I mean, those that have said, well, I prayed the prayer once or I walked down the aisle or I've been attending church or you know, I served or I gave. And then on that day, they stand before the Lord and Jesus is like, hey, I, I, don't even, I don't even know you. And how is it that, that someone may not know him. Well, the evidence of knowing him, of being in relationship with him is doing the will of God in our lives. For many of us, we have religion, but we don't have relationship. And the marker for us having a relationship with God is us actually doing the word of God, actually doing what he says, not just having an affinity, not just showing up on Sunday, not just saying that we're a Christian, but actually taking the word of God seriously, reading it, studying it, listening to what God is saying to us, and then applying it to our lives and living out the gospel. It's not just believing it, having a, you know, a mental assent you know, towards like, hey, I agree with that, but believing it so much that we put the full weight of our life on the gospel, proclaim it with our mouths, and live it out in our actions and in our words. And so this is definitely a sobering reminder for us. And this is what God's people are doing here in Amos. So Amos, you know, gives us some analogies. It's like, hey, it's like, it's like you're running from a lion. You're just gonna be met by a bear. It's like you run into your house, you know, you shut the door and you think you're safe. You lean up against the wall, but then you're bit by a snake. Amos is calling, you know, these people out because in the midst of their desire for the day of the Lord, their future salvation, they're denying the sin that is present in their life. They're not doing the will of God. I mean, a few verses down, you see it literally because they're offering up burnt offerings. They're offering up grain offerings. They're, they're offering up peace offerings, but there's no mention of the sin offering. And so, so they're longing for the day of their future salvation, but they're ignoring the sin of today. They're ignoring the sin that is present in their life. They were not safe with God. See, listen, Satan is a deceiver. I mean, Satan is trying to blind us to sin. It's Satan who's working in his schemes to get us to think that sin is not a big deal. You know, that it's, you know, we get around even other believers and then we, like Satan is at work in the midst of even other believers in a group of believers where a group of believers don't even act like believers. You know, they drink and talk and think and like everybody else in the world as if they don't know him. Or we think like it's not that big of a deal, but sin is a big deal. And so Satan is at work to try not to get us on his team, but to destroy us, to destroy our relationship with God and ultimately destroy our witness in the world so that no one else hears the gospel or believes the gospel. And so Satan, that's been his scheme from the very beginning. At the same time, our own sin, when we walk in sin, it blinds us to the things of God, that we become incapable of seeing uh, how to live a life that, that honors him. Like even back with Adam and Eve, when they sinned you know, in the garden and they blew it, what did Adam do? I mean, God says like, hey, like what happened? The very first thing that he did, he says, hey, that woman that you gave me, like he did a double blame there. Like instead of being able to see that it was his sin, instead of humbly coming before God and repenting, he was blinded to it and started doing the blame game. 
It's so easy for us to do that within our own lives and to justify our sin or to not think that it's a big deal or, you know, or just kind of uh, block our eye to sin within our life because we don't want to uh, open that dark closet within our life and not recognizing that it's a detriment to us because in our sin, we are not safe before God. Well, God speaks in verse 21. He says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fat animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. So God says here that like, I, I hate your gatherings. I hate your sacrifices. I hate all the things that you're doing in my name. I hate your songs. I don't even wanna listen to them. What's, what's clear is that it's, it's not about God, but it's, it's about them. I mean, how are they to honor God when they're denying sin within their life? How are they to, to honor God and not do the will of God? I mean, those two questions are something that we need to consider as well because we can find it even in ourselves where we can say that we're believers, we're following God, and yet we deny the sin in our own life. You know, we deny the fact that we're even... Uh, uh, conscious of doing the will of God and ignoring it. Well, what is it that they were specifically doing? We find in verse 24, where it says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So get this, they were, they were worshiping God with, with their mouths. They're worshiping God with their hands, but they're ignoring the injustice that was all around them. They were quick to gather. They were quick to celebrate, quick to sing songs and long for the day of their future salvation. But they turned a blind eye to injustice and God couldn't stand it. God hated it. It was so hypocritical. He didn't want to hear anything from them because they were ignoring the injustice that was all around them. Listen, if, if you and I, if we truly love God, then we will work for justice and righteousness in our world. Now, the words righteousness and justice um, are almost synonymous in the Bible. In fact, you find them together as we find them in this passage as you read them throughout Scripture. And, and justice is kind of what we typically think of, you know, of retribution. The bad guy gets what's due to him, but there's, there's more to it. It's, it's working to correct situations and systems so that hurt and humiliation stops, um, it's not just coming behind and cleaning everything up, but it's getting our hands dirty and working so that there's real change so that others don't experience a humiliation and pain. And when it comes to righteousness, it's more than just referring to someone who doesn't lie, cheat, and steal, uh, but it's someone who intercedes. It's someone who advocates for those that are vulnerable. It's someone who does the will of God. I mean, all we have to do is look at the life of Christ and how he interceded for us in our sin, in our need, in our vulnerability, in our weakness, that is the model of righteousness that we're then to be to our world, to those that are vulnerable, those that are oppressed, those that you know, are victims of racism. See, God, he expects this of all people, but especially of God's people. Now in verse 25, it continues. He says, did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Siketh, your king, and Cayune, your star god, your images you've made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So God tells them that if they continue to carry on their religion, because clearly it wasn't a relationship, but if they continue to just go through the motions and not actually do what God is calling them to do, if they were going to refuse to repent and seek justice and righteousness, then he was going to send them off into exile. And the sad reality is that, is that 50 years later, that's exactly what happened because they refused to repent. They refused to do the will of God. You see, to repent, you know, it's a military term. It's like you're going in one direction and then you change and you go in a complete different direction. You know, it's not just, you know, hey, I'm sorry I did something, but never really changed course because ultimately that just reveals that we don't want the consequences of what we did. That's not true repentance. I mean, true repentance is a, a change of mind. It's a change of heart. It's a change of purpose and will. It's a change of words. It's a, a change of actions. And they needed to, to see and feel the grief and brokenness of their sin. They needed to see and hear the injustice that was all around them and allow that sorrow to fill their hearts so that they could be humbled 
But that was not their response. Now, as we read through this, and we can see why Dr. King used this passage, because, gosh, modern day, we can, we can put ourselves into this story. I mean, as believers, you know, do we, do we gather and sing songs and, and celebrate together and lift up our hands in holy worship, longing for the day of Christ's return, being so dedicated to reading God's word in our quiet time and our community groups and, and serving in various ways, but ignoring injustices that are around us? I mean, what is our response to racism? I mean, is it righteousness and is it justice? I mean, our church can be one of the most powerful catalysts for justice and righteousness in this community if we do God's will, right? If we seek out to be faithful to what God has called us to do and who God has called us to be, and if we repent of our racism, if we repent for our inactivity, if we repent of our lack of compassion, if we repent of not listening, if we repent of of, of, of basically ignoring the whole thing and pretending that this has nothing to do with me and abdicating my responsibility as a believer and thinking that someone else has to solve that issue. We can't leave any room for this sin in our hearts. We can't leave any room for this sin in our family, in our home, in our community, and especially in our church. So let me encourage you that if your eyes have not been open to racism, I mean, today's the day to open them. If your, eyes have, and if, not, if your eyes have not been open to open them, and if you've not been at work, that it's not too late to get to work for justice and righteousness. I mean, some of you, you grew up in, in a racist home and you had no choice in the matter. That's, that's just what you grew up in. That's what you were taught. But as you've grown into adulthood, there's accountability that you have now an opportunity to make a different choice. You have an opportunity to see people the way that God sees them. You have an opportunity to seek justice and righteousness, and you have an opportunity to break generational sin. And that's something that the Holy Spirit can do in your life and in your home. See, most people, they don't think that they're racist because we think of extremes. You know, you think of white supremacy, you think of the Klan, and you think of like, well, I'm not that. I didn't, I've never owned slaves. My father didn't own slaves. My grandfather didn't own slaves. I'm, I'm not racist. I have, you know, I have black friends, you know, and so we kind of cry that, and yet we cannot extend compassion. We can close our ears, and we can ignore the cries of our black brothers and sisters. And when we do that, we're a part of the problem. We're not a part of the solution when we ignore it, but we're a part of the problem. The gospel, again, leaves no place for neutrality in the midst of racial injustice. This is our problem. I mean, every injustice in this world, that is the church's problem. That's something that we take on. That's something that, that we inherit because we have the solution and we know it's the gospel. Listen, you can't legislate hate you know, out of the heart of someone. It's only the gospel that can wash a heart clean. That's why we fight to rescue people from death to life. It's not about just future salvation, but it's about transformation today. You know, it's about fighting injustice today. It's about being the hands and feet of God today. I mean, as he's walking on this earth, that's what he's called us to as his church, to love people that are oppressed, love people that are marginalized, and to speak up for those that don't have a voice and to link arms with those who are being oppressed the gospel is the only response to bring healing and we've been given the charge and the responsibility as the church to bring the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, to live out the gospel in our world. See, when Jesus, when he was nailed to the cross, it just wasn't just about future salvation, but it was about our lives today. He took our sin and he paid the penalty of every single injustice. And so let me just say to my black brothers and sisters that, those of you that have encountered racism and injustice that has gone unnoticed, God has seen it. And there'll be a day where every, justice, every injustice will be made right. Every tear will be wiped. And uh, know that your rewards are in heaven as you endure and you live for Christ, even in the midst of oppression. And I apologize for uh, the white church of not acknowledging your grief and your pain. It's hard for me to even wrap my head around sometimes how even in the past, how we could justify slavery, how the church could justify slavery, how there would be okay to be oppressed and be segregated. And we're still segregated. I mean, Sunday morning is still the most segregated time 
of our week. And that's something that needs to change. And as a church, we need to fight for that justice. And all we have to do is go back and look at the cross. We have to look at the cross to see what Jesus has done on our behalf. And as we live to be more like him and to model that, to do that in our world. Now, justice, it costs. I mean, it costs Jesus his entire life and it will cost us, but it's absolutely worth it because it's in that that we experience life and freedom and hope and a future. And so as we approach the Lord's table this morning, we're gonna celebrate communion. I think this is a great time for us to come back and reflect on just what Jesus did and just the life that God has called us to because it's that life then that we, we replicate in our world. That as we come to the table, that we prepare our hearts. And one of the things that we do in preparing our hearts is, is to repent. It's this beautiful thing that, that God has given us that regardless of where we've been, regardless of what's come out of our mouth, regardless of what we've done, that we can come before him and, and lay our sin before the cross and walk away in the newness of life. And so let me just say that some of you, some of you need to repent of racism. Some of us, me included, need to repent of inactivity, of not doing the good that we need to do. Some of us have sat on our hands, we've closed our mouths, uh, we've justified it away, we've abdicated our responsibility, and those are the things that we need to repent of, that we haven't locked arms with our, our black brothers and sisters in Christ and carried and shared their burden. And so as we come to the table and we're reminded of what Jesus has done, let's humble ourselves and allow the spirit of God to search us and to reveal and show us, man, where is their sin that we need to repent of? Where's their sin that we need to lay down and to walk away in the newness of life? So let's just take a few minutes and go before the Lord and repent of our sin. And let me just say this, is that if you've wronged a black brother or sister in Christ. You know, the Bible instructs us that before we come to the table for us to, to stop and to go make it right. And so for some of you, maybe this is not the time to celebrate the Lord's Supper, but it's to stop or to get on the phone or go hop in the car or go talk to someone that you need to talk to and repent before them. And I would encourage you to do that. But let's make a real change as a church. Let's truly repent before the Lord and allow God to use us in a powerful way. So let's, let's go before him in prayer. the elements, grab the bread and the cup. Um, it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He's with his disciples uh, and he gave thanks. He broke the bread and he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's, let's remember his sacrifice on our behalf. Let's take the bread. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And so let's take the cup, remembering his sacrifice and the bloodshed on our behalf. Join me in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we long for the day of Jesus' return when there's no more tears and every injustice is made right. Those who have been oppressed set free. Until then, Lord, strengthen us by your spirit to do your will, to fight for justice and righteousness in this world. Uh, As we celebrate your supper, Lord, we're reminded that this is what you've done on our behalf. And this is what you've called us to do on behalf of one another. I pray that you would strengthen, that you would protect, that you would encourage and embolden our black brothers and sisters. I pray that for my white brothers and sisters, that we would not sit idle, but seek justice and righteousness. Lord, we pray for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream to crush the injustice of racism in our world. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
our hope that is our anthem that's all we can do right now that's all I can do is just press into the truth that you're you're in soul control that you're at work what an awful year but God I just thank you that through all the, the trials through all the ups and downs God we can stand firm we can look to you so God I just pray for healing right now I pray for healing in the black community. God, I pray for peace. I pray for protection over our police officers out there. God, I pray for justice and liberty. I pray that we truly would be one nation under God. God, I pray that we would be, God, what you prayed for in John 17, that we would know you, that we would be one. So God, as I close our time, all I can say is I need you. We need you. Our country needs you. Jesus, you are a living hope. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us here this morning. Um, this is just the beginning um, of our conversation about this injustice, this sin of racism. Listen, if, if you need to talk through this, if you're struggling personally, I would just encourage you to, to reach out to one of the pastors and allow us to, to be able to walk you through. At the same time, if, if you need prayer for whatever it is that's going on uh, in your life, you can text Grove Prayer uh, to the number below and someone from our team uh, will reach out to you, but we'd love to be able to pray with you. As a church, um, and let's humbly come before God. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Let our first response to the sin of racism to be repentance. Let's have God open our hearts and open our ears so that we can hear what it is that he has to say to us today, uh, the, tomorrow, and the weeks to come. And let's, as a church, be, be a beacon of justice and equality in our community. But we have to know that it always starts you know, with us first. And so thanks for tuning in. In just a few minutes uh, at 1015, uh, Grove Kids will begin. So uh, hang on for that. See you soon.